Masechet Gitin, Daf Mem Dalid. We saw the Mishnah yesterday that if I own an Evid Kanani, I am not allowed to sell him to a non Jew or to anyone outside the land of Israel. And if I do, then I will be penalized and uh, I can't, I have to uh, sever my relationship with the slave and give him a get shichrur. And if the slave should somehow go free, then um, I lose my rights to the slave. Now we're going to see some variations of the case where I don't sell the slave willingly, but let's say it's taken from me by force. So uh, Tosefta teaches that if a non-Jew came and took the slave in order to pay, uh, to be get repaid a loan that I owe him. So in this case, I didn't make the slave a, um, a collateral and then I didn't pay and I, and I had to give him the collateral. If that was the case, that's the same as selling. I'm willingly giving him, giving the slave. I, why do I make it a collateral and then not pay? But here we're talking about a case where I owe someone a thousand dollars and then they came and um, I, I'm willing to pay, but they said, oh, I like that slave. And this non-Jew forcibly takes the slave in repayment for the loan. Um, so that's case one. Case two is this 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 uh, sikari. Uh, these are Romans that have this little dagger and they go and threaten people and just thugs that take whatever they want. This is to be distinguished between this and Jewish th- uh, Sikari, those were um, Jewish rebels that wanted to start the war against the Romans and they would actually use these little daggers to kill other Jews who wanted to make peace with the Romans. Um, but that's a different story. Here we're talking about non-Jews that just go and just say, say, hey, I like that slave. I'm going to take it. In that case, we don't penalize the owner, even though this slave is being given over, transferred to a non-Jew, but it's illegal and it was against the will, and therefore the slave does not acquire his freedom, and if the slave somehow could get free, then the owner would get the slave back. That's what the Braita teaches. Now we ask, is there really no distinction between the non-Jew who takes it in repayment for a loan and the non-Jew who just takes it for nothing would mean he had a shansu bet hamelech gorno. Im bechavo chayav le'aser. Im be'an parot patur me le'aser. We have another brayta that is regard- talking about ma'aser. And if I have ma'aser, I have, uh, I have, if I have wheat on the threshing floor, I have to give ma'aser. That's just the general basic halacha. However, if some uh, people from the uh, from the government from the king's household come and forcibly take the wheat that says it's ours well then i don't have to give ma'asir because they took all the wheat so why should i have to give ma'asir i have to give ma'asir on something that's mine and i finished processing they just took it that's the law here of imba'an parot. That means they took it by force for nothing. However, if it was behova, if I owed the government money, and then they came and they uh, seized my wheat, then I do have to give ma'asir. We see from this praita that there is a distinction between whether they take it for nothing or they take it for an outstanding loan. If it's taken for an outstanding loan, loan, then it's considered the same as if I'm selling it to them. And if I was selling it to them willingly, I would have to take ma'asir for sure. So to back here... Uh, there should make there should be a distinction between uh, this non-Jew that takes it outright, the Sikadikon. Okay, there, I'm forced. I understand there shouldn't be a penalty. But if he takes it uh, uh, for collection of an outstanding loan, then that should be the same as a sale, and the owner should be penalized and have to give up the rights to his slave. So we answer, No, the case of the wheat is different because the owner is actually benefiting thereby. If he owes $1,000 and he would have to give wheat, let's say he gave it willingly, he'd have to go get um, $1,100 worth of wheat, take off 100 and then be able to have to give the rest of the 1000 Now that the non-Jews came and took it, they took 1000 so now he only has to give up 1000 and not... 1100 so you see he's benefiting from that so he shouldn't be benefiting from uh, fr- from the deal, rather he still owes that ma'asir. So because he is benefiting from the monetary value of what it was taken, because since they took it, now his loan is canceled. Uh, so therefore he still has to give ma'asir. It's not the same as just confiscating it for nothing. Whereas with the slave that's taken on beh- uh, is taken for uh, payment of the loan. Uh, the slave is worth the same value. No, if I wanted, I wanted to pay with cash. I want to pay with something else. I pay with the slave. So there's no monetary benefit to the owner 
for because of the fact that they took the slave as opposed to something else, and uh, therefore um, uh, there's no reason to penalize that owner. Good. Tashema damar rav. Hamocher avdo lefarhang goy yasal leharut. Rav is talking about a similar case where this farhang, it's a Persian word meaning some guard, some government official, and he comes and says mocher, but this is really a forcible force sale. He says, I like that slave, sell it, sell him to me, you know, for some cheap price um, or else. So um, I have to sell it to him and uh, he goes free. Um, now that's the question. Why is he, why does he go free? Hatam, uh, I, I, he, it was by force. So I should be able to keep the rights to him, to the slave, because I didn't want to sell him. So why should I be penalized? And the answer is, Hatam because I, the owner, should have appeased him some other way. Really what he wanted was basically money and he was just using the slave as a way of getting, getting stuff. Um, so I could have appeased him and said, you know what, why don't you take this bowl instead? Why don't you take this cash instead? And that way I could have, um, uh, it could have had an equal loss um, and saved the slave from having to be under the uh, auspices of a non-Jew, right? Again, the whole reason for this is because the Evid Kanani is Chayav Misfot. If he goes over there, then he won't be able to keep Misfot. So I could have saved the day in some other way, therefore, and I didn't, therefore there is a reason to penalize me. Now, Gufa, now we, uh, we quote this again, and we have the same exact discussion again. This is really an unnecessary repetition. Same statement as Rav, that Rav just said, and we ask a question in this version, why? Why should I be penalized? What could I have done? He came and forced me to sell it to him. And the answer is, I should have appeased him in some other way, and I didn't. Okay, this repetition here is very strange. And in fact, if you look at the manuscripts, you'll see only in the first, the first three lines are the printed editions. And they have this extra um, section, but in almost all the manuscripts, except one for one Ashkenazi manuscript, has the same as the printed. But the other manuscripts are missing all all of this, uh, so they don't they do not have that repetition. So that solves that problem. Okay. What if I, I have a, a Evid Kanani and I sell him to a non-Jew for thirty days? So it's not really a sale; it's more like I'm just renting him out. Maybe we can answer this question from the statement of Rav that we just quoted, that if I sell this slave to this uh, Persian official, he goes free. And the assumption is that the Persian official doesn't really want to own him. The Persian official just has some work to do for a few days and then the slave will come back. So we can learn from that that even if it's temporary, Still, yes, it should go free. But then we say, no, it's not the same. No, in the case of the uh, non-Jewish official, the sale is not reversed. He's not going to give it back. Whereas here, I, I, I sell it on condition that it will only be for 30 days. So we don't have an answer to that. Rebimia asks a few more questions. I sell the Ebed Kanani to a non-Jew, but not for his labor. Um, so what would be the point? Could be like we said yesterday, I sell, let's say, the rights to collect kenas. So I sell, I sell the goy, but you can't work him. So if the goy can't work him, then there may be that you'd say there's no problem because there's no way he's going to force him to work on Shabbat or anything else. If I say, chutz mina mitzvot, mahu, I, I sell you the goy, I sell you, I, I sell a goy in my Evid Kanani, but I say, aside for mitzvot, meaning you cannot, you, you don't have a right to force him to go against any mitzvot. So I put, I put that clause into the sale document. So would that be a good sale? Because now there's no reason to worry. If I say, Chus mishabbatot v'amim tovim, mahu, I say, here is a slave, but you can't work him on Shabbat or Yom Tov. So then it would, there wouldn't be a problem. He won't have to be forced to go against uh, against the Judaism, um, uh, against Jewish law, as in Evid Kanani. What if I sell it to Leger Toshav, Listel Mumar Mahu? A Ger Toshav is a non Jew, who, but he keeps the Sheva Mitzvot Ben Enoach. So he's somewhat religious, and so maybe he will not force the, the he won't force the Evid Kanani to do Avod Azara, for example, or eat Evid Menachai, and so maybe he'll be respectful of the Evid Kanani's religious needs. Or, kind of the opposite, if I sell him to a Jew who is not 
observant. So, and now I sold it to a Jew, so you say that's good. But this Jew himself, he uh, he goes and drives on Shabbat and is going to force the uh, this is Evid Kenani to be a chauffeur on Shabbat or to cook him food on Shabbat. And so, even though he's a Jew, but he's a Mumar. So, what's the essen- essential part of this law? Is it essentially that we don't want to give the uh, uh, Evid Kenani to a non Jew, or is it about the um, about his observance of halacha? And so here we have both sides of the question, because we have ways that he can observe halacha, even with a non-Jew, and we have a case of Israel Mumad, where he's with a Jew, but cannot observe halacha. So which is the essential thing here? Now, Likuti Mahu, what if I sell my Evid Kani to a Samaritan? Samaritans keep Shabbat, um, in, in some ways even more strictly. So the Kuti is not going to work the Evid on Shabbat. Uh, the problem is might be Yom Tov, because the Samaritans have a different calendar, than we do for the holidays. Okay, so all these are really good questions, and we're not going to answer all of them. However, Peshot Miha Hada, let's try to answer at least one. Ker Toshav Harehu Kegoi. And one is that a non Jew. Um, uh, who is a ger toshav who keeps the shavim itself and a noach is still like a goy because that person still doesn't have to eat kosher and doesn't have to keep the holidays and Shabbat and so uh, the Evid Kani will have still have a problem in their house so that we know kutiv yisrael mumad amri like a goy amri like Israel. but regarding the others there's a debate and Samaritan and the Jew who is uh, who goes against the Torah uh, there some say they're like a go- they're like goyim some say they are in fact like Jews and sufficient and therefore one could sell um, his Evid Kanani to one of them. Next question. You have an Evid that he himself went and surrendered himself to a foreign army. He wanted so much, he hated being a slave so much that he'd rather be a, a, a prisoner uh, uh, captured by a foreign army and hoping that maybe somebody would uh, would redeem him or something else. So he goes over there. Now I'm the owner. I didn't sell him. I didn't want him to go and be captured. I didn't want him to deliver himself over to an enemy nation. Uh, so um, what what are my options? Uh, well, can I uh, can I try to get him back? Uh, I, I can't get him back. There's no way I can get him back. Not in the Jewish court and not in a non-Jewish court. That's He's there, but I do have an option of getting the value of his, uh, getting his value from the army. Uh, so can I go to that foreign army and say, hey, listen, my slave surrendered himself to you. You have him. I want you to pay me for it. And in that case, he might be able to collect his money. Can he do that? Or would that violate the uh, Arab Mishnah? Because then I am benefiting and getting money from my non-Jew going to a slave. Uh, go, going to uh, to non-Jews. Um, uh, so, uh, or is it okay because I didn't want him to do it in the first place? There's a second complication here, which is that in order to get the money, I would have to go probably to a non-Jewish court um, in order to receive it. But even without that, is, is this a problem of like a sale because I'm benefiting from it? So, so Rabbi Miyad told Rabbi Zika, Zirika, I want you to go and find an answer to this question in Mechiltech. This is an important word. It's the same as the root of the Mechilta, uh, which is the Midrash Halacha on Sefer Shemot. So the word actually comes, Aramaic comes from the word Klal, which means a rule, a ruling. Um, so this is a phrase that means rulings. This is part of oral law. It's not Mishnayot as they translate here. It's actually probably anything but uh, it's um, it's uh, uh, oral laws that are didn't make it into the Mishnah. Basically, collections of baraitot um, are called mechiltech. Go check all the baraitot that you know. Um, it's called that because it's a cloud. These are rulings um, that were that were remembered and collected. Okay, so go check all of your baraitot. Um, this is a, a different um, usage than we we use for the midrashim, uh, the one that we say from mechilta, like mechilta to the Ishmael. Uh, that name of that book comes from the times of the geonim. The geonim mention a mechilta, uh, which is a midrash halacha on shemot, and they mention it for the other books of chumash as well. Um, so the word Bechilta in Geonim refers to Midrash Halacha on Sefer Shemot and, and so on. The word Mechilta, Mechiltech here, um, refers to um, not, not derivations from the Torah, but rather codified laws, rulings 
that were collected together um, outside of the Mishnah. Okay, because it doesn't make sense. He would say, go check your Mishnah. Everybody knows the Mishnah, right? It means go check your Baraitot. Not everybody knew all the Baraitot. Anyway, Nefak Dak Bashkach, and he went and he found, in fact, the Tanya. Here is a Baraita that's also in our collection that we call Tosefta. Hamocher Beto Legoi, Damav Asurin. Someone who sells his house to a non-Jew, um, the money that he receives from there is, pro- is prohibited. We're talking about selling to selling a house to uh, a non-Jew in Eretz Israel. We want the uh, Eretz Israel to be settled by Jews, so there's a rule that you can't sell to a non-Jew, and if you do, the money that you get is forbidden. Now, if a non-Jew comes and forces uh, a Jew to give him his house, and uh, now the owner cannot get his house back, not in a Jewish court and not in a non-Jewish court, impossible. But he may be able to collect the money from it if he goes to a non-Jewish court. He's allowed to do that, according to the Spiraita. He can go to a non-Jewish court, register that the house is indeed uh, belongs to the non-Jew, and that's the only way that the non-Jew will will um, will give some money to back to the Jew. Why? Because it's as if you're saving uh, something from them, right? Otherwise, you're not you're not getting the house anyway. But you should at least be able to get your money. So even though there's two prohibitions here, um, one is a prohibition to go to non-Jewish courts. It's giving them authority. We want people to go to Jewish courts. Second is that he's, um, he's benefiting from the money of, the, of his house that went to a non-Jew. But in this case, it's permitted because it was against his will and he has no other recourse. And so if this is permitted, then it makes sense that it would be also, also be permitted in the first case um, if someone's uh, a slave is taken away, or rather if the slave himself goes and surrenders to a, a foreign army, then I should be allowed to go, I am allowed to go and um, collect money from the army for the slave. The Gemara now rejects the comparison and says, well, maybe it's, uh, maybe it's different because a person can't live without a house. So we're not worried that person will then come, if you allow this, then, you'll, then they'll come to sell their house. Right? And so there's no reason to make any uh, penalty regarding the house. Let him go and collect some, whatever money he can. But regarding a slave, a person can live without the slave, right? A slave helps out, but he doesn't actually need him to live. And so therefore, if we allow the person to go to the non-Jewish army and collect the money for the slave that ran away, then we will uh, we should be afraid that the next time someone else will hear that, oh, that was allowed, then I, I should also be allowed to go and sell my slave to a non-Jew. Um, and therefore, um, it's not the same. Or maybe this uh, it's possible that distinction is not made and there's no distinction and we should learn it from it. So that's the two sides of this question. So we're not sure if we should say that just like in the house, I can go to the non-Jewish court and collect money for the house, even though it was sold to a non-Jew in Israel, so too I should be able to collect money for the slave that was ta- that was that gave himself over, or maybe not. Maybe there's a distinction. We have an answer. Shalach lehu to be amen. Mini Ameh Bar Natan Torah Yotza Lechol Yisrael. This is a nice, uh, confident announcement. He says, From me, Ami Bar Natan, Torah emerges to all of Israel, right? I know the answer. I'm declaring once and for all the Halacha Lemase for this question. And he says, Evet Shepil Atzmol Legaisot Ve'en Rabo Yechol Otsiolo Bine Yisrael Lob Bedine Omot Aulam Mutal Yitol Atama Vechotev Omale Bar Kaot Shel Goyim Mepne Shehu Kemasil Mi Yadam In fact, exactly this case, a slave that goes and surrenders himself to a foreign army and the master cannot get him out, not in a Jewish court and not in a non-Jewish court. He can go and uh, and request and collect the money um, from the foreign army. And in that case, he will write and the non-Jewish uh, write such a deed and register it in the non-Jewish court because he is rescuing his money from the uh, from the non-Jews and so he's not getting the slave back anyway and it was taken against his will so this is permitted.
אמר רבי יהושע בן נביא המוכר עבדו לגוי קונסים אותו עד מאה בדמה רבי יהושע בן נביא says if someone does sell his עבד כנעני to a non-Jew he is penalized we saw above in the Mishnah that he loses the right to ever have the slave back um, and he has to write a get shichurur, but now we're adding more that he actually has to pay a kanas up to a hundred times of the slave's value in order to redeem the slave and get him out of the uh, um, out of the ownership of the non-Jew. So that's a lot of money, a hundred times more. If the non-Jew says, "No, I'm not going to pay him, give you, give it back to you for the sale price. I want double. I want triple, even a hundred times." Davka or lav davka. Now we say a hundred times. Is that literally a hundred times, or you just saying a lot but you know I mean literally that much uh, so another law about selling big animals to non-jews is not allowed why well it would be no problem itself to sell a, an animal to a non-jew the problem is would be renting an animal to a non-jew big animal we're talking about a work animal and so the problem here is that if i own an animal and i rent it to a non-jew he may work it on shabbat and i'm not allowed to have my animals work on shabbat right that's in the ten commandments um, all my any animal owned by me has to rest on Shabbat. So because I'm not allowed to rent a, to a non-Jew an animal, um, uh, also the rabbis expanded that and says I shouldn't sell because if I sell, I may come to rent. All right. So now if I do uh, sell my uh, l- large work animal to a non-Jew, um, so Reshakish says we have a fine, a penalty, and I have to buy it back for up to ten times the amount. And so we see that uh, this is not uh, davka, right? A hundred times, ten times. It just means a lot more, but it doesn't mean an exact number. Okay. Then we say, no, maybe not. Maybe it actually is different. And uh, for an animal, it's only ten. But for a slave, it's even more than ten. And it, even up to a hundred. Why? Because for an avid, every single day that he is owned by the non-Jew, he has a problem uh, um, uh, with keeping mitzvot. Um, and it's my fault because I sold him to a non-Jew and now he can't keep mitzvot every day. And so that's a, that's a problem. Whereas for the animal, it's really only I can't sell it because then in a different case, I may come to rent it. And if I rent it, then on Shabbat he may work it. So the animal case is much less severe of a problem than the Eved who's going to have to go and eat non-kosher or avodazara, uh, whatever his, slave, his, his master will make him do. Um, and that will be a problem. Vika de Amre, or another version of this uh, of of those of this discussion. Amarabi le Yeshua ben Navi hamocher avdo legoi konsino to ad asara bedamav. He was switching the numbers around. And if I sell, um, if I do sell my eved kenani to a non-Jew, I have to redeem him back for up to ten times the amount. Davka or lav davka? Is that exact ten? Up to ten? That's it, right? Is that you know a fixed amount? Or is it just a, a, a round number? Shakish said regarding if I sell a big animal to a non-Jew, I have to buy it back for a hundred times. So we see that it's not only ten. Ten is just saying a lot, but even if it was more than ten, yes, I would have to pay even that for to buy my slave back. So it seems that this would be lav davka, and we say no, maybe not. Shana eved de la hadar le. Slave is different because slave doesn't go back to me. Um, uh, the law is that if I sell my slave to a non-Jew, I lose my rights to ever collect the slave back. So I have to redeem him. And he goes free, so that's why a slave should be less, only ten times, because I'm going to have to I'm going to have to pay for his freedom, and then I'm not going to get him back. But now we ask, wait, that doesn't make sense. Wait, so uh, for the animal, I do get it back. It is true if I sell my animal and then I want it back. And then, and then I, I'm, I'm forced to buy him back, so I have to pay whatever, five times, however my, how much I pay back. I get the animal back, whereas the slave I didn't. Yeah, okay, fine, but that's not so much. So just make it one more. If the slave, you said, I have to buy it back for up to ten times, 
and that's because the slave goes free, then the animal that um, I, I do receive back, so I should have to pay up to 11 times, right? It would only be the difference of the value of the animal. Why up to 100 times? So that can't be the reason. And rather, um, an Eved uh, being sold is not so uh, common. Animal, selling animals, that's uh, everybody has animals and they sell lots and lots of animals. But slavery was not so common and not to, to sell a slave was also not so common. Um, and so therefore, when it comes to a slave, the, here it says that they did not make a gezera at all. Okay, there is a gezera, but the gezera is a smaller gezera, just have to, only up to 10 times. But when it comes to an, uh, uh, selling animals to non-Jews, and that was very common, there the rabbis had to make a stricter gezera, and in this version, that's why they said that would be a hundred times. Good. Next question. So uh, let's say I owned an Evid Kanani and I sold him to a non-Jew, but then I die. Uh, so does the penalty go uh, go uh, continue on to the son, right? We, generally we say we, the son should not be uh, punished for the sins of the fathers. So in this case, if the father sold him and then didn't yet pay the fine to redeem that slave and buy him back, um, and 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 then and dies, does the son have to? Im tim sedlama saram ozen bechor umet kansu bo acharav mishum di surah de oraita yaval hachai surah de rabanan. Let's compare it to other cases where a father makes a sin, um, and so this one is about a bechor behema. A firstborn animal is given to a Kohen. Now, if it's unblemished, the Kohen has to sacrifice it. If it's blemished, however, the, sa- the Kohen can keep the whole thing for himself. So it's better for the, ko- for the Kohen if it has a blemish. Now, you're not allowed to make a blemish in a Bechot animal on purpose. But what, and what if you do? Then there's a Knas. So here the question is, let's say the father Kohen, he slit the ear of the, of the Bechot animal so that he could take it for himself. So then we have a Knas. Okay, now you know what? You can't eat it because of that. But then he dies, and now the son inherits this Bechor animal. Um, so we say, Kansubo. Yes, we continue the, the uh, fine afterwards. And therefore, if, the, if these cases are the same, then we would fine the son also and make him pay to redeem the slave. But we say, no, it's different. Over there, maybe that's Isur de Oraita. Uh, regarding to the, um, the Bechod is Isur de Oraita. But regarding the slave, not selling a slave to, uh, to a non-Jew, that whole thing is only the Rabbanan. And so there would not be a penalty in this case, so we can't compare it. Another case to compare it to is uh, regarding work on Chola Moed. There are certain types of work you can do on Chola Moed, Avad Aved, and things like that. But let's say it's not any of those prohibited work that I schedule to be precisely on Chola Moed. Um, if I do that, then the rabbis make a gez a kenas and say you cannot benefit from that work that you did. Uh, during Cholam Moed. Now, what if he did work on Cholam Moed, benefited from it, and now and then died? Can the son um, uh, benefit from that work, or do we uh, continue the knas? Um, so here we say, They do not continue, right? The father went and he built a shed on Cholam Moed, and he wasn't allowed to. The son can still use it and benefit from it. Uh, why? Mishum de lav adavadi sura. The son didn't uh, didn't make didn't uh, um, violate himself. The son didn't do anything wrong. So would we apply that here also? That the son did not violate any law. Well, so we say lidide kansura banan veha lete or dilma lemamone kansura banan veha ite. Do we say that the um, the the knas was made to him himself? And he is no longer around. The father who sold the slave is no longer around, and therefore it does not pass on to the son. Or do we say that the rabbis um, made their penalty against the money, and the and the money does go, go and the money is here. The money continues on to the son. Um, the price for buying the uh, for selling the slave now the son has it and that is penalized uh, such that you know what you have to go and um, and uh, redeem the slave right does it go on the person or on the money
Tinnitus. Oh, that, oh, that's the question. And the Biase answers, Oh, I know this. I know, I know the answer from Mishnah in Masechet Shevi'it. It says, Sadeh shenit kavesa b'shevi'it, tizara lemosei shevi'it. Ni taiba o ni daira, lo tizara lemosei shevi'it. If I have a field and I uh, took out thorns during the shevi'it year, I'm not supposed to do that, uh, but that's not such a big deal. That's not the major type of work, and therefore I can uh, still go ahead and use the field after Shevi'i to, to plant uh, in it. However, if I uh, made the field better by putting fertilizer, or an, I can put fertilizer two ways, uh, either put it directly by hand, or um, I take the animals and I pen them in a certain area so that the manure will uh, go in that area. So either way, those are both not allowed. And, and, and if I do that, that's a major form of work and they have a penalty. I cannot use that field even after Shivi'it is done, I cannot sow the field. Okay, that's the Mishnah. Uh, the law is that, let's say, the father did improve the field, put manure on it, but he died. The son can sow it immediately and is not penalized. Therefore, you see that the rabbis only made a penalty on the father who actually did the prohibition, but not on the son. He didn't do the prohibition, and so he is not penalized, and therefore that should be the same case uh, for us. Abaye agrees with this law and gives a yet another example of someone, uh, you have some, uh, some fruit, and I go ahead and I make it tameh. Um, so that is a, that's a problem, and that's a, I made it worth less now, and I'm, I'm liable to pay. However, what if that person dies before paying, and now the, now does the responsibility go to the son? Um, it does not, right? This is a kenas, and does not go to the son. Making something tameh is not actual damp, physical damage. And uh, therefore, uh, the halacha is that some, some damage that is not noticeable, not physical, is not called damage. If the father had actually caused physical damage and didn't get paid, then the son would have to pay. Um, but here, uh, not so. However, the rabbi said, listen, even if it's not physical damage, you still cause the person a loss, and therefore you should have to pay as a kanas. But the kanas only applies to the father and not the son. So now we have yet a second uh, proof that uh, here too, in the case of the uh, slave, the father sells a slave into, to a non-Jew, uh, the son would not be penalized and to have to pay to redeem that slave. Okay, all the hosad la adits. Now the Mishnah uh, said I'm not allowed to sell a Evid Kanit to um to anyone who lives outside the land of Israel, whether Jewish or not Jewish. So Braita now adds to what the Mishnah said, if I do sell Evid Kanani to someone outside the land of Israel, they gain thereby their freedom because Evid Kanani cannot be forced to live outside the land of Israel, right? That's a mitzvah to live in Israel. It's a prohibition to move outside. And therefore, the first owner loses his right and the second guy who bought it also is forced to give a get shichrur, um, and he seems like he will lose out his money as well. That's the Tanakama. Rabban Shimon ben Gamliel Omer, Pamim yasa u pamim lo yasa. Rashbak says, that depends on the, on the details. Kesad, Amar peloni avdi mecharti u lifloni antochi lo yasa. Lantochi shebe antochia yasa. If the seller says, I am selling this, uh, 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 the, my slave, um, uh, I, or I, I sold him to this person who comes from Antioch. Antioch is a city, a very big city up north, northern Syria, Turkey. Um, so he's this person that comes from there. Then that sale is valid because it just means that the person came from Antioch, but maybe now he lives in Israel, right? So it's like you're saying someone is uh, from, you know, that Moroccan or that Egyptian. It just means that they came from there, but now they live in Israel. Um, so that's not a problem. However, if I say I'm selling this slave 
to this Antiochi in person that is in Antioch currently, then he, he gains his freedom because there it's obvious that I'm selling him to live out with this person who lives outside of the land of Israel. That's a Rashbag. Okay, now we ask on Rashbag. Different Paraita says, um, that if I say I'm selling him to an Antochi Stam, then it's uh, it's no good. Uh, where all, it's only okay, it's only a good um, sale if I say this Antochi who lives in Lod, who lives in Eretz Israel, then it's a valid sale and he doesn't go free. So now we have a contradiction between the Rashbag here and this ta- and this Baraita, in the case where I say I'm selling him to an, an-, 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 an- Antochi in person. Um, and Rashbag says it's no, it's no, it's no, it's a, it's a valid sale, and it does not go free. Um, and here it says that he does go free. So we answer la kashia had it le beta beeretz Israel had it le ushpiza beeretz Israel. In fact, the uh, Rashbag who said that it's a valid sale, that's talking about where this Antiochian person actually has a house in Israel. So then we can assume, I meant that he's going to take him to Israel where he has a house. But this Baraita is talking about where he, where he only has an inn. He has, no, he has a hotel room in Israel. So, But he lives outside of Israel. So there, the assumption is that he's going to bring his slave not to work in his hotel room, but rather to work in his house outside of Israel. Good. Ben Bavel Mahu. The cases of a woman who lives in Israel and she owns slaves and maidservants. So that's fine. Now, uh, a man comes who lives in Babel. He comes to Israel and marries her. And his intention is to take her and her slaves and everybody back to Babel. So what do we say about that? Um, is that the same as causing uh, the slaves to live outside the land of Israel? It's kind of like now they're being, are they being, would you say they're being transferred from the wife's property to the husband's property? And uh, the husband lives outside, so then they should go free, or maybe not, because eventually when they're divorced, uh, the slaves will go back to her. We're talking about a case of Nixes Son Barzel. Um, this is a property that she owns and will get back. Um, at the end of the marriage, but in the meantime, during the marriage, he can enjoy the uh, the, the the fruit of their labor. Um, so the ownership is kind of split. So that's a complicated question. Now there is a machlokent in general when they get divorced or if they get divorced, um, what happens to the slaves? Now, so really, they should go back to her because they are hers. But let's say he wants them. He says, "I'll pay you the value." You, right set value I'll pay you I'll pay you, uh, uh, um, I'll pay you for them um, so is he allowed to keep the slaves or not so there's machloket about that some say hadin ima that she says no these are my slaves they're valuable to me I know them well personally and I, I, I want them back at the end of the marriage While others say that no since he had them the whole time and he was using them he could say listen I'm going to continue to work them and I'll pay you for their value, but he gets to keep them. So we'll ask both ways. On the one hand, if you say they, they go back to her, she can say, I want my slaves back. So since she gets them back, they're like hers, and therefore it's not a problem. Um, uh, she lives in Israel. She's going to go back to Israel one day. And so she did not sell these slaves to someone, her husband, who lives outside the land of Israel. The, so therefore they, they, they remain slaves. Or do we say now at this point while they're married um, all the prophets go to the husband so they're basically working for the husband and so it's like it's his and therefore it's like he purchased them and if he purchased them and took them outside the outs of Israel then they go free. We can ask the other way. Do we say that since he has the right to keep the slaves even after their after the divorce and pay for them? So basically, it's like they're his, and therefore they should go free. Or do we say, since he did not acquire the slaves for himself, because those have only has a rights to the labor and he doesn't have to keep them at the end. So right now he's just using them, but he doesn't own them and he's not going to keep them. Then it's the same as she um, uh, owning them. And therefore they, the slaves do not go free, take all, all this is left unresolved.
אמר רבי אבו, שנה לי רבי יוחנן, עבד שיעשה אחר רבו לסוריה, מחרו שם רבו יעשה לחיירות. Let's say the master, let's say he lives, let's say he has two houses, one in Israel and one in Syria. And he leaves Israel and he goes to Syria. And the slave, on his own, on his own account, decides, you know what, I want to follow you and come with you to Syria. I don't want to stay back in Eretz Yisrael and the you know, other house that you have. Um, and then, so he goes on his own. That shows that the slave is willing to live outside the land of Israel. He went on his own. And there, when they're in Syria, the master sells him. He still gains his freedom. Okay, so it doesn't matter that the slave went out on his own. Still, now the master um, uh, s- sold him. And now he, uh, 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 so you're not, still not allowed to sell a, um, a slave outside to someone outside of Israel. Okay, that's the ruling of Rabbi Yochanan. But, Rabbi Chia says that if the slave, on his own account, went and left Israel, then he lost his right to live in Israel. So he, he, he's, uh, he has a mitzvah to live in Israel. He went against the prohibition, left. That's his own prerogative. Now the, slave, now the master has a right to sell him outside the land of Israel. So how are, we, how are we going to resolve Rabbi Yochanan going against the Braita? La kashia. Kan dat rabo lachzor, kan en dat rabo lachzor. Depends. If the master's intention was to return, he just went for the summer up to Syria, but he's going to return eventually. So the slave who went with him, he went, says, Los, I'm gonna, I'll come with you for your trip for the summer, and then I'm going to come back. So he doesn't lose his right. That's Rabbi Yochanan. Whereas though if the master does not intend to return and the slave comes comes with him, then the slave shows that he doesn't care about living in Israel. That's the Barait of Rabbi that he loses his right and he can be sold. And indeed, this is not a question here, but and indeed, we have a Barait that supports this distinction. Yosef Surya. Um, uh, first, we have to clarify the language of the Braita. Here it says that a slave goes after his master to Syria, which sounds like he can be forced. Yose, he can be forced to go to, go with him to Syria. Right? Not only does he not have to follow him, even, even if they were in Israel, even if they were outside of Israel, a slave or a wife can say, I demand, I want to make Aliyah. And they can make Aliyah even... Uh, and uh, even without the agreement of their husband or owner. And so if they can go, all the more so, they cannot be forced to, to leave Israel. So Yosef can't mean that the master forced the slave to come with them. So rather, the slave went on his own, um, uh, own accord uh, to, with his master to Syria. And then while he was there, he was sold. So this Braita makes a distinction explicit. If the master was going to go back, uh, his, it was intended to go back to Israel, so then the slave doesn't lose his right because he just said, I'm going to come with you on your trip. And uh, therefore, he is forced to to free the slave. But if the master left permanently and the slave went with him willingly, then that shows that the slave doesn't care about living in Israel and, the slave, and therefore the master has a right to sell the slave outside the land of Israel. All right, good. Amar Rav Anan, Shamait Mine de Mor Shemuel Tarte. Rav Anan was a student of Shemuel. This is the first generation Amora Shemuel. Um, there is another, uh, and so therefore it's the same as Shemuel that we're about to see. There is another Amora called Mor Shemuel Mor, with two Mors, who is a later Amora. But Avanan is an early Amora, a student of Shemuel, so here it does mean Shemuel, even though Shemuel's, Mor Shemuel is quoting himself, Shemuel, in the following statement. But that, that could be Shemuel is teaching Rav Anan about the Machloket that he had with Rav. So he says, I learned two things from Shem- Mor Shemuel. One is what we just talked about. If I sell land to you during the Yovel year, so now if I sold it to you, um, you know, in the middle of the uh, a cycle, in the 25th year or whatever, um, then when Yovel comes, then I get the I get the money, uh, I get the, my field back. It comes back automatically, Yovel. Um, so here the question is, I during the Yovel year, I have this land and I sell it to you. Well, then it's going to uh, immediately snap back to me. So what is the status of that sale? As Machloket, Rav says, the sale is valid. And then the second that you pay me money, 
um, then the uh, the land comes back to me. But the sale is a valid sale. So in that case, for sure, I can keep the money. It also has other effects, like if the uh, if there is um, furniture, let's say, or stuff on the land. Um, so anything, whenever you, you sell land, anything that is on the land also gets sold agav. So in according to Rav, since the sale is a valid sale, if I had some furniture on my lawn, and I sold you the land, then you will acquire that furniture. Only the land goes back to me. So I keep the money, you keep the furniture. But Shemuel says uh, that no, the sale is not a valid sale at all. It doesn't make any sense to sell something that's going to come immediately back to me. The sale is null and void. According to that, any furniture that's on the land, I keep because you never bought anything in the first place. Um, now, it would seem that the money that you paid, I would have to return to you, right? Because if the sale is invalid, um, then, well, you gave me money um, for no reason. But Ravanan is going to question that, that very thing. Um, who, who keeps the money? So Ravanan says, regarding those two statements he heard from Amor Shemuel, I know that regarding one of these two cases, the money is returned, and one of them the money is not returned. I'm just not sure which is which. So regarding the first law that of uh, that he heard from Shemuel, that was where um, uh, I let's say I owe in the Ebed Kanaani and I sell him outside the land of Israel, um, and there the second guy has to has to free him and loses out on the, on having the slave. Now he paid me money. In that case, what happens? Do I have to then give the money back? Uh, not clear, maybe in that case, or maybe it's in the second one where I sold land during the Ovel and then the land immediately snaps back. Do I, as the seller, have to give the money back? So Rav Anand says, I know that in one of these cases and only one of these cases, Shemuel said the money goes back, but I'm just not sure which one it is. So can we clarify that? So Rav Yosef explains, oh, let's see, I have a Braita, and the Braita says that someone who sells his Eved uh, outside the land of Israel goes free. And the second guy, the buyer, has to give a get shichirur. Um, now, if the buyer has to give a get shichirur, that means the sale went through. Because if the sale didn't go through, then the buyer has no has nothing, right? The buyer didn't receive anything, and the the slave still is the full ownership of the first master. So, from the fact that it says the second guy has to give a get shichirur, we can learn that the, yes, the sale went through. Um, and since the sale went through, I don't have to return the money, right? The sale was, was, sale was a valid sale. I got the money, I leave, and now you have a problem, the buyer, because uh, the buyer caused the slave to um, leave the land of Israel. I mean, both of them are somewhat responsible. We'll get to that in a second. Um, but anyway, the buyer was uh, partly responsible, and so therefore he, lost, he loses out on his, on his purchase, and he has to free the slave. And so since in that case, that surely uh, Shemuel says the money is not returned therefore we conclude that when Shemuel says um, that the money is returned that's talking about the second case where there's no sale at all um, I give I sell you your uh, land during the Yovel then land never even transfers over the sale is completely invalid and therefore when you gave me the money the you gave me the money for uh, uh, that for no reason, and I have to return the money, which uh, makes uh, makes sense. Okay, but Ravanan, but I tell us, Shmuel, there, Ravanan, how come Ravanan couldn't figure that out? The answer is he didn't know that Baraita. We assume that everybody knows the Mishnayot by heart, but um, but I thought there were different collections of but I thought in different places, and there was no one centralized uh, list of but I thought that everybody knew. So Ravanan didn't know that Baraita, and that's why he wasn't sure. Now we're just going back to Rav Anan's, uh, even without the Braita, would you have been able to figure out this dilemma from 
Shemuel's statement himself. So since Shemuel said it's not, there's no sale. Um, so can we figure out that if there's no sale, then the money has to go back, right? Because then why, 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 how, sh- how, by what right do I can, can I keep the money if there was never a sale? And the answer is Don't no, maybe there's no sale, but the money still I can keep as a gift. Um, uh, kind of like you know, if I sell you the Brooklyn Bridge, you give me money. So you can make an argument that says I can keep it because uh, it means you gave it to me as a gift, right? And uh, you gave it to me fair and square. I didn't, I didn't go and steal it from your safe. And uh, therefore I can keep it um, as a gift. I mean, that's what Abanan could have, ha- how he could have interpreted Shemuel. Um, de'it, and this would be comparable to someone who tries to do Kiddushin with his own sister. Someone goes to his sister and says, and gives her a ring. There is no, there is no transaction. There is no marriage, right? Because this is adayot. So not only is it prohibited, but the kiddushin does not is not effective at all. Now, what about the ring? Who gets it? Adav says the ring goes back to the uh, to the brother um, because uh, there was no transaction. All he deserves it back. And Shemuel, in that case, says, "Oh, she keeps it. She keeps it as a gift." Right? Listen, you gave it to me, fair and square, and uh, even though there's no Kiddushin, but it doesn't matter, you still gave it to me fully, and therefore it's mine. So, uh, Ravanan thought that maybe Shomel would say the same thing regarding the Yovel, even though I'm selling you land that's going, that it doesn't even leave my, my property um, I, that I keep, but you gave me money, and maybe you knew that, and this is, um, I'll consider it a gift. That's why he thought uh, so, uh, and, and, and and it's not true in this, in the case of the Yovel, the um, the money does, uh, does it has to be returned. Uh, lastly, Amad Abayel Rav Yosef, my Hazite Kansinan La Lokeach, now by asks Rav Yosef about this law that, um, if the if I sell you a slave uh, um, and you uh, to outside the land of Israel, then you lose out. You have to free the slave, and I get to keep the money. So it's the buyer that is uh, incurring the loss. Why should the buyer incurring the loss uh, incur the loss? Nikneselamochad. Let the seller incur the loss, and the seller should return the money. Uh, because he he also caused the uh, the person to leave the the slave to leave the land of Israel. And his answer was the mouse is not the thief, but the hole is the thief. Uh, so okay, the the uh, the mouse is compared to the um, seller. The hole is compared to the buyer because the the mouse steals the cheese and puts it into the hole. And so, uh, so that's his claim that it's not the mouse's fault; it's the hole's fault. Well, he says back to him, "Amale mei lav achbera chora minale." Wait a second. If there was no mouse, then how would the hole ever get it? The hole can't go and and get the cheese. It it needs the assistance of the mouse. So really the mouse is the main one responsible or they're equally responsible. Okay, that's a fun analogy. And so this is a good question, right? Who is, um, who should be liable for uh, causing the Ebed Kena'ani to leave the land of Israel? Should it be the seller or the buyer? And so Rav Yosef says, makes more sense that wherever the prohibition is, that's where we should have the penalty. And uh, currently, the slave was taken to outside the land of Israel by the buyer. The buyer has the slave, and therefore the buyer should be the one penalized, and he loses out the money that he paid for the slave. Baruch Adonai Le'olam. Amen ve'amen.